Hey everybody, welcome to a very exciting edition of Notes from Hollywood where we're going to be talking about this fabulous new film, Ahead of the Curve. You know, it's described as a new documentary about one of the most influential women in lesbian history, but I'm going to surprise you and just tell you, that really, this is a movie that's about anyone who sees it. And the filmmakers who are waiting in the wings may wonder what the heck I'm talking about. But this movie is about life. It's about the world. It's about connection. It's about what happens when an individual decides to express their truth. It's about sacrifice. It's about love. It's about um, triumph and tragedy. And I'm saying this improvisationally. I'm not using a script. I'm just speaking from my heart. So, yes, this is about a powerful lesbian, but it's really about a powerful person, a powerful human, and it's about what you can do if you decide to do it. I, I, and I hope I got your attention with that. So, uh, ahead of the curve, I'm going to give you a, f a few more details about the, uh, uh, the film. And then I'm going to uh, bring on the filmmakers a, a few minutes into the show. So from the official website, Ahead of the Curve is the story of one of the most influential women in lesbian history you've never heard of and the impact her work continues to have today. Growing up, Franco never saw any representation of queer women. She didn't even know it was possible for a woman to be gay. When she realized she was a lesbian, it changed the course of her life. In 1990, Franco created a safe space for lesbians in the form of Curve magazine. Her approach to threats and erasure in the 90s was to lift all kinds of lesbians up and make them beautifully visible. The magazine helped build a foundation for many intersectional movements being led by today's activists in the, faith of in the face of accelerating threats to the LGBT community. Decades later, as her legacy faces extinction and she reassesses her life after a disabling injury, she sets out to understand visibility work being led by an intersection of queer women today. Featuring Andrea Pino Silva, Kim Katrine, Denise Froman, Amber Hikes, Jewel Gomez, Melissa Etheridge, and Leah Delaria, Ahead of the Curve celebrates the legacy of a movement while considering the agenda of its future. So that is what the film is about. We're going to meet the filmmakers, and I'm going to actually... Uh, surprise them and you by playing the film's trailer. But before I do that, so there's a very inspirational moment in this film where it's a cliffhanger. Are they going to be able to keep the magazine alive or not? Or, or not? And they, they do keep it alive, but I'm not going to give you any more details than that. Well, uh, this summer, Promo Homo TV expanded into a full-fledged broadcast network with five series and 33 episodes. My fall season launched a week ago, and I decided, what the heck, I'm going to launch a Patreon account that allows you to subscribe to the show for as little as $3 a month. If you want, just share the show. Let other people know about it. So anyway... The last day of the week, the first week of broadcasting was National Coming Out Day, and I had two people sign up. You know, I went from zero to two. So I want to just thank Brad Fur, who's the publisher of GayDesertGuide.LGBT, and I want to thank George Francis Giles for being two people that that ho have hopped on to the Promo Homo TV bandwagon. Uh, so. Let's go into the documentary, then I have a bit more information about this network and the two filmmakers. Here is the, the uh, trailer for this amazing movie. Please welcome our panel of Power Dykes, Francis Stevens, publisher and editor-in-chief of Deneuve, the hottest lesbian magazine. Deneuve, the leading lesbian magazine. There wasn't a glossy magazine for lesbians anywhere. She decided, I'm going to make one. That's total rock and roll. I love my job. 
job. I love my job. Whoever was in curve, like that was it. That's how you knew what was going like on. Like the latest musicians, in terms of, like, the latest like, artists. Yeah. yeah. I think it's only in hindsight that I can fully appreciate what Franco had to sacrifice. It was very hard to be out and open in the late 80s. I think we should do away with gays if possible. A lot of people lived in fear. Once I had a guy spit in my face. We did not see ourselves represented in any positive mainstream way. There was nothing that showed what my life was all about. I was the one that was supposed to start this magazine. She got the idea and then she's just like, oh my God, I need money. So I just applied for a bunch of credit cards all on the same day. I just cashed them all in. And there they come. I'm going to bet an exacta with two long shots. And my horses came in first and second. And Raphael wins At the, the end of the day, I had enough money to start the magazine. Do you know what the difference is between parsley and pussy? What, Franco? I don't know. I don't eat parsley. Where can I find a woman like that? When the magazine put me on the cover, it allowed women in our own community to see a well-spoken, funny, intelligent, charming, gentlemanly butch, which is basically who I am unless you cross my fucking path. For the first time, we could see black, lesbians, Asian, working class women, just the power of seeing me. In the last 24 hours, you know, I heard this thing that I never wanted to hear, that the magazine could be coming to an end. As we became more visible, we also became a target. We live in a systemic, racist, sexist, anti-LGBTQ world, and we have to fight it every day. Dear straight people, why do I have to prove my love is authentic? Visibility looks like us being able to be the authors of our own experience. When there is so much at stake, our positive stories are some of the most powerful tools we have. Every time we put out a magazine, it felt groundbreaking. Like the work was so important and the work is not done. And I'll be back with two filmmakers after this. You win me, it's alright. Together, all our lives, a new star is inside. We're falling, it feels right. It's okay to hold me. I really love what I get to do. I'm not going to wait another minute to bring on my two guests today. Uh, Jen, how do you say your last name? Rainin. Rain, Jen Rainin and Rivka Beth Meadow. Welcome to the show. It's so great to see you. Thank you for having us. It's so fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, um, I, I saw your faces when I was talking about your film at the top of the show, and I was speaking from my heart. Has anyone ever talked about your movie that way? I imagine yes. Yeah, I mean, it, 
it's uh, it really at its core it's a story of an underdog. It's just like you said, you know, it, it is a story for everyone, and, and everyone can see themselves um, in in how the way that Franco has chosen to you know move through the world. I mean, that's we've all we've all been in that place where there's you know, I just wish somebody would. We just need this, or if we only had this, then it would be better. Our whole community would be better off. And Frank would just act on that. And Rivka, what about you? Uh, are you are you getting similar feedback about the film and the power of one? Yeah, we love your effusive terms. It was so much fun making this film because we really, we talked a lot about community. We have a huge value of community in this film. And we really think that um, it's an empowering story of an underdog and Franco met her own needs. And by meeting her own needs, she met the needs of her community. And we hope that people see themselves in her. I mean, she's, you know, she was badass, but she had a dream and she made it happen. Well, um, I wanted to share that it was my intention to multitask when I was watching your movie today. But I had to stop everything I was doing and sit down and tune out the world. I wasn't even tempted to pick up my phone more than maybe once. I was so engaged. I was so riveted from the moment of the first frame. So I just want to say that uh, one that of the makes things so happy. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm Thank you. serious. I'm serious. It's not that I didn't. Uh, it's not that I didn't want to be completely focused on your film. I just we're all doing a lot. So I, but I'm just so glad that I did it. And then I I, I, uh, I gave my that gave myself that experience. And then I, I'm not going to say her name, but I asked that smart speaker to play uh, Melissa Etheridge for me. <laughs> I was in some, in the mood for some Melissa. I so um, my uh, my my big question, and I'll I'll go to Jen and then Rivka to give it some order to to it, but. One of the things that's very powerful about this film is that it's very historical spanning decades, but it meets the moment in terms of the conversations that are happening now in terms of intersectionality. It's incredible that those two happened. It just makes this film feel so current. Uh, what would you like to say to that, Jen? <laughs> um, it was the most fun part, I think, about well, one of the most fun parts about making this film was, was you know, looking at, I mean, really, we, we set out initially to tell this historical story because it's, a, it's an important piece of, of uh, our history, of queer history, and um, it seemed like an important and fun story to tell, but it also happened in the 90s. And... Uh, as we were doing the search, we realized, you know, a lot of um, of the of what Franco and her her team um, did in the '90s really seeded a lot of the, the work that is happening today. And that moment that happened, we were well into filming, probably more than half done, when Franco got that call from. Um, it's, it's, it's not much of a spoiler alert because this is the, basically the first scene of the film. But she got a, she got an email from the current owner of the magazine saying that it looks like the magazine is probably going to go out of business within a year. Um, that wasn't the original film. The original film really was a historical piece. So when that email came through and then the subsequent call, it set us off on a different direction that allowed us to really... Um, look deeply at what's happening now who's doing the kind of uh kind of work that franco and her team did in the 90s who's doing that now what does that look like now visibility work today and uh yeah it was it was such an honor to to get to be by franco's side as she had those conversations and and really got a sense for like what what does the community need now and and what's the same what's still were we still fighting that hasn't shifted. Uh, Rivka, what would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I think I'll add that uh, 
We were really, we became really interested in looking at sort of the short term and the long term effects of Franco's work, like the short term visibility work that she was doing, and then some of the long term systems change work. And so I'm so happy that that is something that resonated for you and came through because really Franco was um, seeing sort of the, the fruits of a lot of her work come through uh, what was going on. I mean, we call it intersectionality, inclusiveness, uh, just there, you know, there's such layered identities that people embrace now and more and more of our culture understands those identities are, you know, many myriad kinds of ways that we present ourselves. And that's, you know, so much, I think, uh, has, it has a lot to do with our collective power and how we're able to embrace that and hold that together. Um, so yeah, it was, <laughs> that's, I'm glad that's coming through. Totally. Uh, you know, this show is going out live and I am able to put comments on the screen. Fellow filmmaker Quentin Lee says, doing great work, Nicholas. I don't know if you're familiar with Quentin, but he has some amazing films out there. Um, you know, one of the things that I realized more so than ever is how I'm so white and that yeah. even though I've been immersed in the fight for LGBTQ equality before we used all those letters and more, I just didn't see so much. And because of the awareness that's coming up today, I realized how, uh, how I had such tunnel vision as to the, the plight and the, the, uh, of others. Um, so once again, the co the cultural context in which your film is coming out, where these issues are at are front and center, and then you have contemporary interviews that address not the specific news events, but generally, but in general, the importance of inclusivity and um, reaching out to the marginalized and and uh, the oppressed and elevating people that are invisible and creating our own spaces. Um, but I'm supposed to ask you questions, not give monologues. Uh, so, uh, let, let me jump in, uh, uh, with you, Rivka, um, because I'd love to know what inspired you to get into uh, filmmaking. How did you end up here? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, so I think, uh, there's kind of, I'll tell you the short version of the story. Um, Stories are uh, mesmerizing. I started off as a sculptor and I actually hurt my back and I couldn't lift my heavy sculptures anymore. And my brother was a cameraman and I've always loved films. And so I just was started taking classes and learning a lot more about filmmaking and then became obsessed about maybe 15, 18 years ago. So yeah, the um, privilege to be entrusted with somebody's story is, uh, and then to go deep is really uh, just, I think my life's work and I love it. And I feel really fortunate <laughs> is that. Uh, before I bring I your brother, that's oh. so cool. <laughs> yeah, her brother, yes, a family yeah. affair. Before I bring Jen in for a similar question, um, I, I know a little bit about Jen's personal life because she's in the film. Uh, do you identify among the uh, as a member of the queer community? I don't know that about you, nor nor that nor would you have to. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I do identify. I'm um, I'm either bi or pan. Um, I am married with my wonderful husband, and I also date my beautiful girlfriend. So. <laughs> That. I will watch that show when it comes out. <laughs> Have you lined up your production team? <laughs> yeah, there are lots of children involved. Um, yeah, so oh, I, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. So, so uh, I know I know Jen that a little bit about what inspires you is is the storytelling and mm -hmm. story, telling stories that make a difference. I do remember that much from your bio, but. How how did you get into this uh, yeah. I, uh, this general field of filmmaking? So I've been an actor for a long time. I did a bunch of um, very low budget, um, independent narrative film, and 
then got into doing some um, producing, executive producing, and and have loved that. I have a lot of projects going on in my life, but this particular film is it's it's the story. It's this story. I felt really compelled um, to to put this story on film. Um, I guess it was like the first uh, years of my marriage and getting to understand who this insane person was that I married and, and what an incredible impact she had on the world and, and realizing how, um, you know, our stories of our role models, particularly for women, particularly for queer women, are not well told. We just, you know, like if you look at what's out there in the film world, the vast majority of, of LGBTQ film is aimed at men and telling men's stories, which is fantastic. We love our men, we love our men's stories, but we really need to to see ourselves and our stories and understand our lineage, where we came from, and and um, and you know, I, I I just I felt so compelled to get this story out there in the world that it turned me into a filmmaker. <laughs> Well, you alluded to this in what you just said, but uh, if I w I'm going to treat this as the Q&A after I've seen your film, because I did. So the question that I would have asked then and that I'll ask now is, all right, how did you meet Frank, Franco? Uh, yep. And how did you get together and end up getting married? I, I'm sure that's a whole movie in itself, but what's the cliff notes? Oh, my gosh. Um, I was starting, uh, gosh, it was like, 12 years ago, starting a lesbian travel company called Sweet. It didn't last very long, but it was very sweet. And, um, and my business partner said, hey, we've got to go and meet Franco. We're going to go to the Curve uh, holiday party. Franco said she'd help us out with some ads. And I thought, what kind of a name is Franco? And so <laughs> we went, and uh, something happened the minute I saw her. I just... Um, she said, uh, you're a little late, but there's some cheese and crackers, and I'd be the smooth woman I am, said, I don't need cheese or crackers, and she said, really, tell me about that. And we bonded over, <laughs> over our love of vegan ice cream, and uh, that's kind of how that started. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, now, Rivka, how did you come to meet Jen? Uh, uh, how did that connection happen? Oh, I so I'm so lucky. I got to meet Jen through a beloved mutual friend that we have. And uh we were fast friends and just have <laughs> um loved being able to work on this project together. In fact, we loved it so much we started a production company in August together. <laughs> All right. So there's tell more films. stories. Yeah. <laughs> more stories about the women we love. <laughs> That's well, right. I, I love that. I love that. So um, when uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, have you been able to screen this film with a live audience? Did the, Was that able to happen before? No. <laughs> no. We, we, are, we premiered at Frameline in San Francisco. And, at a drive-in. Uh, at the drive-in. And so it was, we, we, we were so fortunate that Frameline was willing to take the chance because at that point, I, I don't know, I mean, there may be one or two people have been to drive-ins in the pandemic, for, but I don't know, I hadn't heard of any other premieres happening at, at um, in June at that point at drive-ins. And so um, we were super excited to do it and it was really scary, but we did it. Uh, Rick actually had a brilliant idea to do it on the day that would have been the Dyke March in San Francisco because Dyke March wasn't happening, Pride wasn't happening. And um, we, but I ended up selling out the both screens of the drive-in. It was an, almost an hour drive outside of San Francisco. A thousand cars came out. People decorated their cars, got dressed up. Had we had our sparkly masks, <laughs> and uh, we had a DJ playing. Paige Hotel, you meet in the film. Um, it was fantastic, and it was extraordinary to be able to do it in community, like where we could actually see and hear the reactions of our audience. And it was so, this is my first directing experience, you know, my first film. And to, I was really um, feeling pretty ripped off that I was launching it in this year where um, it's largely online only. But 
I got my experience. I got my I got my audience experience there, and also at Outfest, um, Franco and I drove down to LA and sold out another drive-in <laughs> with the Outfest. It was amazing. Uh, how is Franco now? How's she doing? Does she does, does she use that pronoun she? Yes, she does. She goes by she. Her. Okay. Yeah, she's doing really well. It's 2020. Well. I know to ask that question. Yes, we're evolving. You know. We're yes. More aware and inclusive. It's great. Yeah, Frank was great. She's right now in, in the next room playing games with her family. She's got a very tight knit family, um, and they have a weekly family game. And so she's. <laughs> you can hear her a little bit in the background, probably yelling. Uh, well, the 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 healing of her relationship with family is a great a, a great part of the film. So at the top of the show, you heard me say that this film is about everyone, and I really meant that. I meant that. So one of the one of the things that Franco says toward the end of the film is that this magazine, you know, is what I came to Earth to do, and it, it's part of my legacy. And, but when I look at the impact that she must have had by all the different lives she met and what all of those people went on to do, to describe it as having created this magazine, as massive as it is, is really small in terms of what she actually did by the way she chose to yield her life force. Yes. I mean, I've been, um, I can't tell you, I can't even count the number of times that I've been out with her when um, women have come up to us and said, uh, you know, you, you literally saved my life, and here's why. You know, you, you, I felt that I was at the end of my um, ability to go on. I felt so alone, and then I found your publication, and I was connected to community. Um, I mean, it. You're right. It's it's a it's a big big impact for somebody who so few people have ever heard of. Okay. Well, and well, everybody you, go who, ahead. You know, when we were making this film and we would talk about it, we made it's about three years in production, and everyone who we would say, you know, they say, "What are you making a film about?" We'd say, "Well, you know, Curve Magazine, the founder of Curve Magazine, Franco Stevens," and people would just launch into their Curve story. Usually, it was about you know, where they first saw the magazine or they still have the magazine and they kept issues and they're under their bed at their parents' house. And people just, it's, it was such a, such an enormous flood of nostalgia and storytelling for a lot of the kind of the older women or like maybe 35 and above. And then some younger women were also like, if they didn't know about the magazine yet, they were like, wait, what is this magazine? We need to know. Tell us more. Who is Franco? And they're really interested because we we learned that, um, like Jen was saying a little bit earlier, we haven't documented our history, uh, our lesbian history, quite as well as we might have. And so this film is an effort to start to shift that a little bit and fill in some of those spaces. It well, it, it's a fantastic film. Um, this is a geeky question. But when you were filming the uh, the panel discussion at the convention of, uh, about the use of the word lesbian, how did you get such good audio from from the people in the crowd? Ah, we had a really good the, sound person. <laughs> I was so that, patched through. We patched through the system and we took their feed. Uh, well, the audio was just amazing, uh, and well, throughout, it's just technically very well done. So, um, when you think of a writer of a documentary, I mean, clearly th that makes sense when you look at when you when you get get into it. But as you shared, Jen, the 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 meaning and the purpose, the story of your film changed halfway through. So, how much do you write the documentary, and how much does the documentary write you? Oh, that's such a good question. That was, and that's one of the, the many, many lessons that I learned in making this film. Um, <laughs> I, Rick and I, I think part of the reason that we decided to um, continue working together and, and to, to launch our 
production company is that we uh, we had to write so much around this film um, and we realized that we love doing that with each other and we do, I think, a good job of it. Um, you know, I, I think it's true probably pretty universally with most documentaries that you don't really know what you're going to get. You do, it's not scripted. So you, you, you write hypotheses and then like any scientist, you keep shifting them as you learn. And um, so, I, you know, we did, we did, there was a lot of writing involved, but it's not, every time we would learn something new, we would shift the way that it came together. I don't know, I don't really know how best to describe that. Do you have more on that, Ruka? I mean, I, I think that was brilliant. It's absolutely right. I think what, you know, what you're saying, we make these hypotheses and then we listen. And so I think part of the art of making a documentary film is knowing what to pay attention to and what to let go of, right? So that's, that was a lot of, we got to have a lot of conversations around that and just really, you know, if something felt true and, and right and we needed to follow it, um, we did, and then it uh, it generally it, it worked it worked really well. I mean the <laughs> yeah, it's there's some magic. There's some kind of kismet that happened, and I mean you set it up as best you can, right? And then you just hope for something pretty magical to happen. So this is another like weird weird question, I'm sure, but the lift car the lift driver at the beginning did you did you get someone did you call them up and say do you have time for us to shoot this how did you tell the lift driver they were going to be in a documentary was it staged were they on the clock <laughs> that was movie magic <laughs> <laughs> you have a friend i my guess is you have a friend who drives for lift and they had the emblem and they picked you up. That's my guess, but you know what? I don't yeah. have to know everything. That's right. <laughs> I don't have to know everything. So, okay, I just want to say this. I'm going to use a four letter word right now for the audience. Our world is really fucked up right now. I just have to say that. It is horrifying what's going on. And as much as your film is about history and the present, there are so many unknowns. And um, I've never used that word on my show before. I don't use it very often, but our conversation is just so real. I don't want to be anything other than real. So I would like to know from each of you how you're coping. What are you doing to get through this? Are you keeping hope alive? And I'm going to go to Rivka first. Okay. Do you want me to go to Jen? Do you need to think? <laughs> uh, no, I'll just say there's some, I have some pretty intense family health stuff going on right now too. So when okay. you're like, you no, know, there's, um, there's, I think that, I think it's, I think there's a clarifying quality to this moment right now, I know for me and I know for a lot of people, and that is how I'm coping, um, is by being really clear and not about what I want to do with my time and energy and life force because uh, it's because nothing's promised. We don't get to know how long we get to be here and wasting time is not uh, not an option. I mean, and, and the flip side of that is also for me in particular, I don't want to give you any platitudes, but that like also being a little softer with myself than I generally am. So just trying to be um, just really present and with who I'm with, with my kids, um, with my husband, with my girlfriend, with my friends, just being really present. And if I spin out, I spin out, but then I can, you know, go my sister lives downstairs and I can go be with her so I don't know if that's helpful but yeah really feeling into those things that make me feel most alive is pretty well I'm sending you love and light for your family health situation 
and yeah. thank you for being so personal and allowing me to ask such a personal question. Well, oh, I asked yeah. it, but you answered it. So thank you. Thank you for that. Jen? Um, I, a lot of what Rick is saying really resonates with me. Um, in the fires uh, that have just been happening in the Napa area, um, my home was, um, gosh, the fire line stopped 100 yards from my door. And um, <laughs> just because everybody needs to have one more piece of dress, that was mine. Um, I'm feeling incredibly fortunate, but I'm also realizing like there's a, I walked up in the woods behind the house uh, right after the fires and it's cleared things out. It's taken away distracting bramble, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Like it's really, the forest right after a fire is very calm and um, and and I, I I guess I'm I'm seeing that sort of as a metaphor for what's happening right now. Like it feels like we're in this giant inferno of insanity a little bit. And what is helping me, I think, is um, being very very clear with myself about what I what I want to do with the rest of my time. Um, I. I I'm getting incredible amount of joy from bringing this film into the world, from writing. Um, uh, Rick and I are working on a um, on writing a pilot for an episodic right now, and uh, it's and we're also we have a couple of short documentary films that we're working on. Um, the joy that I get from creating, I mean, that's I feel like that's why we're here. That that joy, the love that we share with each other, with our partners, with our families. Like it's, it's, I'm leaning really heavily into all of that right now. And I'm, um, I'm not making time for the, the bramble that's burning away. Well, thank you both. You know, my personal mission statement is to honor and express my creativity in a way that makes a difference. And the reason that I was, that I was and am so in touch with the power of one and the way that Frank's story is told in your documentary is because I came out in the early 80s at Arizona State University when we were learning what would become the HIV and AIDS epidemic and people that were so young were dying. And I was a communication major recovering from a conservative Republican upbringing and finally discovering what was really going on. And I learned then that the most powerful thing I had was my own voice and my willingness to tell my truth, as messy as it can be at times. Um, but uh, I think it is important for us to all focus on the positive, focus on what we can contribute, focus on, on, on uh, and uh, moderate our consumption of other things that we need to consume to stay informed. I want to show the website for your film. We don't have to rush to a conclusion, but we can wrap it up. And I'm just wondering, uh, as uh, people have seen that, do either one, do either one of you wished I had asked a particular question? And if so, what is the question and the answer? <laughs> well, you said just now what your your personal life um, motto or your mission is, and I I just, it just I launched into what my my personal motto is so i kind of wish you'd ask that and my motto is suck the marrow <laughs> suck <laughs> the marrow that's right I said from a, are, are you still a vegan or was that just the desserts <laughs> or the salads it's just the dessert <laughs> uh, oh okay okay all right well uh, you know what yeah you got to live every <laughs> every every breath and rivka um so mine would be what we water grows Ah, I love that. That's beautiful. So I'm going to surprise you by putting something up on the screen uh, because I want to be of service to the future for you and I want you to talk about it. So there we have it. Uh, oh.
So I was just working on that with Franco right before this call or this uh, this show, and um, yeah, we're launching uh, with Franco. We're launching the Curve Foundation. Um, you can, um, of course, go to the website and and watch as we progress. I, it looks like at this point we're going to launch our first program in March, and so we're in the process of uh, of building that out. But the intention is. Uh, that we're going to continue to carry on the mission of CURB, um, but do it as a nonprofit, as a foundation, in a way that we can support um, young queer voices coming up um, to, to really support queer women's culture. That's beautiful. Uh, Rivka, would you like to add anything to that? So, no, the Kerr Foundation is really um, Jen and Frank, and I'm adjacent to it, so I'm a supporter of the Kerr Foundation. Okay. Um, if you'll indulge me, I just want to say that when I was in college, I was in an interpreter's theater class, mm -hmm. and uh, I ended up working on a project with three women. It turns out two were lesbian. I think one identified as bisexual. We came out in this performance piece that we did at Arizona State University <laughs> in 1985. Oh and- um, Tell me there's video. <laughs> I, there's not video of that, but um, anyway, my whole coming out was very informed by uh, learning about lesbian and women's issues and whether or not they even liked men and all of these different things that were parts of the conversation then and and it was just very powerful and I, I've I've personally connected with many people featured in your film Mariah Hansen, Suzanne Westenhofer, um, uh, Kate Kendall, I could just go on and on and in 1993, I created a public access TV show in LA that went on for seven years called Tinsel Towns Queer. So I have this archives, and that and this show right here will actually live at the USC archives, uh, uh, the, the one institute, the one archives at the USC libraries, excuse me, there's so many different names, the one archives at the USC libraries. Um, and uh, so I love being able to shine a light on lesbians and the queer community. And uh, also I'm focused on giving a platform to people that are uh, invisible and underrepresented. So in your own lives, if you feel like people would be right for my show, please send them my way. Um, do either one of you like to, well, I want to just let you both say some final words in, uh, in conclusion. Well, I just had a question for you because I'm just really curious. Did you know about Franco before you saw this film? I did. Okay. Yes, I knew who Franco was. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, uh, and I know, I knew that, that both magazines existed, but mm -hmm. I couldn't, I, I didn't know that, oh, they one became another, the other. Um, but yes, I did know, uh, I did know, that I did know about Franco, and I wasn't seeing her for the first time in the film. I did not know Jen was married to her, though. Yeah, yeah. that was new. Awesome. Well, I asked because um, we we did a several test screenings, and when we had our gay brothers at some of the test screenings, they didn't tend to know either about Deneuve or Curve or Franco. And they were really excited to find out and learn and support and tell their friends. And so I guess with my last words, I'll just invite all of our gay brothers who might be watching to come and check out this history. It's it's uh, foundational for us. Yeah. F fantastic. And uh, Jen. Oh, goodness. Uh, I just, I feel incredibly excited to be bringing this story into the world and to share it with the whole community. And I'm feeling very appreciative um, that you've included us in this show and, and given us a little bit more of a platform. So really mostly I just wanna say thank you. This is, I, I so enjoy the authentic and connected conversation. Well, thank you very much. You know, even though this is Notes from Hollywood, I happen to be based in Palm Springs. Your film is coming here within the next few weeks.
Yes. Uh, and um, so uh, for people in my local audience, we have that, that to look forward to. Any other screenings that you can talk about? Yes, many extra screenings, actually. If you go to curvemagmovie.com, um, you'll, you'll see there's a whole screenings page, and we keep it very up to date. Um, and there are screenings that are geo-blocked to specific states, but also there are several that are um, US-wide. There's some um, out of the country as well. So I uh, don't know where, where your audience is um, located for this show, but wherever you are, there's likely to be a screening near you. And then we are hoping to um, have wide distribution uh, starting likely uh, next, next spring. I actually, I, this is going to sound pretentious. I do have a worldwide audience. Um, so Fantastic. I do know that for a fact. I can look at my stats and tell you the countries. Yay. But uh, anything that I can do to support you, it's my honor and my privilege. And I really just want to thank you all for being on the show uh, uh, once again. So uh, I wish you the best. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. So, you. so generous. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my pleasure. So you got to see it. You really just have to see this movie. Uh, hopefully you get to see it uh, sooner than later, but I'm sure that this movie has a big life ahead of it. And as I said at the top of the show, it is a film that is about all of us. It speaks to the power of one and what happens when we decide to tell our truth, to speak our life force into the world. Uh, and I encourage you to do that. I'll see you next time. You're with me, it's all right. Together, all our lives. A new star is inside. We're falling, it feels right. It's okay to hope